Mr. Griffin is a visionary philanthropist and leader in the world of finance. He founded Citadel LLC and Citadel Securities in 1990 and has grown the company into one of the world's largest alternative investment firms, managing over $62 billion in assets. As one might expect, Mr. Griffin has received numerous accolades and recognitions for his contributions to the finance industry and is widely regarded as one of the most successful hedge fund managers of our generation. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Marquez and Mr. Griffin to the Four Arts Society of Palm Beach. And I'm on the far wall. Yeah. Far wall. Thank you. Okay, back house today, and eh? thank you guys so much for attending. So Ken, great talking to you here in Palm Beach. Folks, I'm really looking forward to talking to Ken Griffin about the future of finance. As a reminder, Mr. Griffin's hedge fund, Citadel, made $16 billion in profits for clients last year, outperforming pretty much the entire industry, right? Ken himself made $4 billion, according to our calculations at Bloomberg. But you guys are going to excuse me if I start off by asking about the present and not the future, because I want to talk about the U.S. economy. Ken, part of your success last year was correctly predicting that inflation would be the worst in 40 years. This year, inflation is still the hottest top home markets. What are you doing in Citadel with inflation right now? Is inflation still a big bet at the fund? How are you betting on it? So first, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here at the Four Arts Society in Palm Beach. And if we look at the, the mission of the Four Arts Society, it's about the appreciation of art, and I, I can't paint. <laughs> I have a few paintings, but I can't paint. Or music, and I'd have to pay you to be here if I were to sing. <laughs> Literature, which is just not going to be our forte today. So it's drama is the fourth category. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, trying to pivot to your talents here. So we're going to have to play with that as our theme today. We're going to have to yes. have a good conversation with a bit of drama <laughs> to make sure that we're in keeping with the history of the Four Arts Society. Now, if we, if we think about the economy, that's, that's not going to get a lot of drama going, except for last year, with inflation at near record highs in our lifetime, it was a pretty traumatic experience for American households. We saw negative real wage growth for workers in America, and for retirees who are usually on fixed pensions and who are depending upon their savings to, to maintain their standard of living, last year was a, was a particularly horrific year. And that increase in inflation, driven by the, the sheer magnitude of the stimulus spending on the back of the pandemic, really caught our policymakers off sides, and in particular forced the Fed from going from a position of being incredibly accommodative to, in recent months, rapidly raising interest rates at one of the fastest paces ever to try to put the inflation genie back in the bottle. Now, when you manage money, you, you make money by having a difference in opinion as compared to the broader market. And for us, the difference in opinion that we had was that inflation was going to be very hot, and it was, and that was a source of revenues for us last year. This year, I, I'm actually really pleased that we're not far away from consensus on inflation. The market overall thinks inflation is going to head back towards the upper twos in the foreseeable future. And we are not materially different than market consensus at this point in time. So I truly hope that the, the market's right on this call. January gives us some pause for concern. Labor market red hot in January. We don't know how much of that is the weather effect. January was unseasonably warm. We're going to know a lot more in a few days when we see the February payroll numbers, which we expect will be much closer to 200,000 in growth versus 500,000 plus in January, that'll give the Fed a bit of comfort that they're getting the job done of cooling the economy, bringing down inflation, and putting that, that pretty evil inflation genie back in the bottle. Mm -hmm. But then what's your take on what Jerome Powell said today, that the Fed was prepared to increase the pace of rate hikes and that the terminal rate is likely going to be higher than previously anticipated? A lot of people are reading that as a sign that they're going to go faster. So he created space today to move by 50 basis points mm -hmm. on the next hike. You know, they'd come into this year 
pretty clearly telegraphing that 25 basis points was going to be yes. the per meeting rate hike for the early part of the year. And then in some sense, taking the foot off the brake and seeing where the economy lands. And, 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 and in fairness to the Fed, the interest rate tool as a means of controlling inflation, is a, it's, like a, it's like having surgery with a dull knife. It is a really difficult tool to get the job done with because you hit the housing sector, you hit the manufacturing sector, you hit parts of the economy that have a very high sensitivity to interest rates. And you tend to leave the rest of the economy relatively untouched. So the Fed doesn't have as much impact with their tool as you might hope. And although they've raised rates considerably, it's not clear how long the lag effects are for the impact. No. And once the impact starts to play out, how, how damaging that impact is. So they are, they're in uncharted territory. It's a difficult place to be. My, you know, if, I could, if I could tell one thing to the chairman, I would, I would tell him to say less. I would just be writing a message. We're going to put the inflation genie back in the bottle. We're going to do what it takes to make that happen. And we're going to raise rates consistently until we see very clear evidence that we put this behind us. Because every time they take the foot off the brake or the market perceives they're taking the foot mm -hmm. off the brake and the job's not done, they make their work even harder. And at the same time, remember, they're impacting in a very, very harsh way a very small part of the economy. And that's really tough for those businesses that live in that part of the economy. So you're, you're talking about the damage. Do you think we could see a recession this year? So we have the setup for recession unfolding. What we're seeing is that the American savers did what you'd expect. The American consumers did what you'd expect over the pandemic. Mm -hmm. They were handed enormous amounts of money by the government. Most were able to keep their jobs because of work from home and otherwise. And let's be clear, you couldn't go out for dinner with your friends. You weren't traveling, so you saved money. Yeah. And the American consumer saved trillions of dollars. Now, the flip side of this is the U.S. government spent about $5 trillion over the pandemic to allow us to stay at home and sit on the sofa. Put $5 trillion in context, we spent about that much money in real terms in World War II to win mm -hmm. World War II. We spent as much money in the war against the virus as we did to save the free world yeah. in the 1940s. And that money that went to American consumers has been coming back into the economy post the vaccinations, post the reopening of the economy, and it's been spent at a torrid rate. Best guess, there's about a trillion change left of excess savings. That's being spent at roughly $100 billion, $120 billion a month, which means by the end of this year, in some sense, the punch is out of the bowl. And that makes next year, late this year, a very interesting transition point as this, as this post-pandemic orgy of spending comes to an end. And then we'll see the true, the true strength in the economy. And that's going to be a really interesting moment in time. So you promised drama. And as of now, we have the orgy of spending and the, knife, the, doll, the doll house knife surgery, which I thought was a lot of drama like, already. We like the doll knife yeah. one, yes. Yeah. And, I, I, and I do think that you know, everyone has these very high expectations that the Fed can just work magic on inflation, and they don't have it that easy. And that's why I, I really believe that the consistency of messaging is so important, mm -hmm. because part of how the Fed gets the job done is the perception of the American public that they can get the job done. Right? Inflation has a significant component around expectations. Mm -hmm. If you think prices are going higher, you're going to be much more demanding in your wage negotiations as a union, for example, or as an employee. You're going to really be focused on how to get your wages up as fast as you can because you see the bills coming your way. Mm -hmm. The Fed breaks expectations of inflation. It does wonders in terms of helping make the economy work better. Do you think they're doing a good job in framing the message? No, I, I think the variance in the message over the last couple of weeks has been incredibly counterproductive. Okay. And what do you think is the terminal rate ultimately? I mean, how long, how far are we going to get and how long are we going to stay there? You know, the markets are pricing in that we'll see Fed funds somewhere in the mid fives. That's probably about right. And of note, the market predicts that by the end of next year, mm -hmm. we'll have cut rates by 200 basis points. 
Mm -hmm. So the broader financial markets thinks that we're heading towards a very sharp peak in rates in the, in the months ahead, followed by a period of, of relative calm in rates, and then a pretty fast cut in rates throughout 2024. Is that your perception as well or no? I, I think that's probably a pretty fair assumption as to how the market's going to play out. Mm -hmm. We are going to hit this moment in time where, where clearly inflation is decelerating and the punch bowl being empty. We're going to see the economy start to slow as demand fades away. Mm -hmm. So we're running a big story on Bloomberg today about how, how markets are basically shrugging off the risk of a debt ceiling standoff. At which point do you think that becomes a relevant theme for the markets? Is that risk underappreciated? So re regretfully, there is very little common ground between the, the two parties that are in power today. In fact, I'm not sure there's any common ground between yes. the two parties that are in power today. And, and as such, unfortunately, it will probably not be until we have the volatility in the market that goes with an impending default mm -hmm. that we will actually see cooler heads prevail, a compromise reach to kick the can again to the typical budget process where we'll see, I think, the real contours of what the magnitude of government spending cuts will be and or the nature of tax increases will be. So I think the debt ceiling will be a non-event until it is an event. Mm -hmm. That event will shake the confidence of the House and Senate. They'll find a common ground to kick the can again. They're very good at that. It's a, it's a national sport. And then we will address this in a haphazard, mediocre way later this year in our routine budget process. But there will be a compromise. I mean, God willing. <laughs> and, I, I, and I do think it'll be the market volatility that will drive that compromise to kick the can. Mm -hmm. And the reason we have to do this is America owes about $30 trillion today. And if we defaulted on our debt for even a minute, the increase in interest rates that we would pay for, for decades to come would cost our economy dearly. I mean, if you think about it, if, if our current $30 trillion of debt had to all be refinanced at today's prevailing interest rates, mm -hmm. we would spend about six and two thirds percent of total GDP Mm -hmm. just servicing our debt. That means you'd start work in January, and by roughly the second half of January, having had no money to take home, you would have worked long enough to pay the interest bills for the year on the U.S. debt. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that one of the ways Washington was trying to carve out a way of this was tax hikes. In fact, President Joe Biden said yesterday that he was considering a tax hike in incomes above $400,000, right? So is, do you think that's the right policy? That's the right way to go? So the, the Democrats are very enamored with, with uh, the political talking points of raising taxes on the rich. And that works for a very brief period of time, but there's just not enough money there to pay the actual bills. And so unless we are willing to bring spending under control, we're looking at tax increases for all Americans. You know, in, in Illinois, for example, which has a, a chronic deficit spending problem on pension, unfunded pension plans in the hundreds of billions of dollars, they don't raise, they haven't been able to raise income taxes yet, mm -hmm. but they've raised almost every other tax you could ever imagine, from gas to property. And those taxes actually aren't, they're not paid by the wealthy as much as they are by the people who are in the lower class and middle class. They're incredibly regressive. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at a state like Illinois, which prides itself on being so progressive, and then you look at where the tax burden actually falls as they continue to try to put their balance, their, their, their balance and budget, it falls on the very people that that government claims to be interested in protecting. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm worried about is that the talking points are cheap. The political victory that comes with it is cheap, but the hard work comes from having to have the real tough decisions about where to cut spending. And of equal importance, how do you take the tax base and broaden it and not just find taxes that disproportionately affect people in America that are living paycheck to paycheck trying to make their bills happen? Mm -hmm. 
You mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that your vision for inflation does, doesn't differ that much from the market. Where do you, what exactly are you, how are you positioning with the fund right now? Like where are the biggest opportunities for a hedge fund like Citadel right now? So we are, we are constantly positioning our capital against where we have a differentiated view as compared to the market. So for example, if we think a company is going to announce strong earnings for a quarter that others don't anticipate, mm -hmm. and perhaps guide for, for stronger future results, we'll be long that stock. So where do you have a differentiated view now? Uh, right now, I would say it's fair to say that we are, we're, we're somewhat licking our wounds from the incredibly strong economic data in January. Really? So we did not anticipate that we would see such strong economic data in January, and that's forced us to reevaluate our, our interest rate and inflation positions here in the United States, or for that matter, around the world. And, and part of what we do, I think, very well as a firm is we accept reality, which is, wow, we didn't see this, this payroll number coming. We didn't see the inflationary print that went with this. We've got to go back to the drawing board and rethink our framework and redecide how to deploy our capital. And we'll do that for a couple of weeks, and then we're back at it. But, but a very successful investors are very quick to acknowledge when they've got it wrong. And they don't let, uh, well, I think of it as like thesis creep come into play. When you're wrong, you're out, you reevaluate, you decide what to do next. And that can sometimes mean doing the exact opposite of what you were doing just eight weeks ago. And in particular, with, with rate markets around the world as volatile as they are, we are constantly changing our position from long or short rates in various countries around the world, like mm -hmm. every couple of weeks. You've mentioned Illinois policies, and I can't help but think of the contrast with Florida, which is where we are right now, right? And then I wanted to shift a little bit of the gears here and talk a little bit about Florida. So we're in Palm Beach, and I'm sure our audience is gonna remember that at the height of the pandemic, Ken turned the Four Seasons lobby, the Four Seasons ballroom, I'm sorry, into this gigantic trading floor, the heart of Citadel Empire, just six miles down the road. And then apparently he liked Florida so much that he decided to bring the entire company here. Ken, how's your life in Florida? Well, actually, let, let's go back to that story for a moment. And, and okay, did I tell it wrong? It, no, it's close <laughs> enough. It's close enough. We, we realized that we needed the ability to maintain markets in the US equity market at the start of the pandemic. We're the, we're the largest trader of equities in the United States. We account for roughly one in four shares that change hands every day. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, we have a job that transcends just being here for Citadel. We view ourselves as we want to be here for the tens of millions of retail investors that count on us to provide liquidity and the thousands of companies that look to us as being their principal market maker in their stock. And at the Four Seasons in Palm Beach, in about five days, we built a trading floor that could have handled the entire equity volume of the United States of America. And right now they are using it for parties. So I, I actually, I took my son to the Four Seasons when we were doing this. I wanted him to see what 200 people working at midnight looked like because this is how you make things happen. And when we finished that trading floor build out, we put a hundred and some of our colleagues and their families there, shut the doors, no one allowed to enter, no one allowed to leave. So, so to the MBA, this is how you build a bubble, and this is how you do it fast. And that served us incredibly well. We were, we were able to handle our trading in the US equity market flawlessly throughout the pandemic. And I would say that I, I have a debt of gratitude to the leadership of Palm Beach, the city, mm -hmm. the county, and the state for their willingness to help us make that happen in five days. I, I mean, in New York, we'd still be filing paperwork to do this. And it's, it's a real testament to the get things done mindset that goes with leadership in Florida. It's, it is so palpable when you meet with the, with the government leaders and civic leaders in the state that Florida is open for business. They want firms to be successful here. They want firms to be successful here and they want people to have a high quality of life here. 
Now, it's, it's not a secret. I have a, a, some property here in Palm Beach, and I have oh, really? this <laughs> rolling dream that one day I'll build a house here and I can retire here one day. It wasn't me who drove the decision to come to Florida. It was the hundred and some people that lived in that bubble who said, why would we trade the anarchy in Chicago for the tranquility in Florida? So let me ask you the, the next question then. One thing I'm fascinated with is that you're relocating a gigantic company with more than 4,000 employees around the world to Florida. Obviously not all of them are gonna live here, but how many employees do you plan on having here in Miami? Do you plan on having in Miami? How many do you plan on having in Florida? Like how's the planning of moving people to Florida going? So it's going, it's going, well, here's the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge right here right now is getting office space. <laughs> because we're not the only people who are saying, you want to be in Florida. And the migration of, of talent to this state is just mind-blowing. So I would say that by sometime late this year, we'll have 250 people in Miami. Yeah. I would think three to five years out, we'll have between 700 and 1,000 people in South Florida. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about that. Many of my most senior leaders are, have either have moved or are moving to here from our offices outside of, outside of New York City. And that's important to stress. New York is one part of the United States where people are, are very optimistic about the future still. And the mayor of New York understands clearly he has to address the issues of crime. It's a big focus of his, and I applaud him for speaking out on this issue after Lori Lightfoot was defeated as mayor in Chicago. I, and we have, a, we have a really big commitment to New York City because a number of my senior team members, that's been home for their careers, that's where they wanna be. So in the United States, our, our two premier cities will be Miami and New York. Mm -hmm. And then of course in Europe, London's an incredibly important city for us. Are you, going to, are you still going to keep an outpost in Chicago or no? I think you picked the right choice of words. <laughs> outpost. There'll be an outpost. No, I have, I have a number of colleagues in Chicago from whom Chicago is home. And for a litany of reasons, they're not going to leave Chicago. And I'm, I'm frankly, I'm grateful for them being on the team here at Citadel. We're going to have to move offices in, in Chicago to a safer location. I mean, where our office is, is, is literally not where we want to be because of, of just just pure safety concerns. I mean, when you've got hooligans lining the street, throwing things at ongoing cars outside the front door of your office, you know you're in the wrong part of town. The challenge is there's not many right parts of town left in Chicago. And it's a serious problem. If I put a video up here, you'd almost want to cry. You'd go, that, that can't be America. Since you brought up Chicago, I have to ask you about the, about the mayor run. Obviously, you just mentioned that Lori got defeated, but do you have a candidate for the runoff or you're not following it at all? So I'm out of Chicago politics. <laughs> like, I, like a salmon swimming upstream oh, to die? Oh, you brought it up. I've, I've, I've had enough of Illinois. I, I will tell you, I'm, I really admire my colleagues who have supported Paul Vallis publicly with their voice and with their money. I hope that Paul Vallis becomes the mayor of Chicago. I think he's the best choice for the city. But Illinois is going to tougher out ahead of it. It really does. Until, until Springfield chooses to change course and prioritize jobs, education, and public safety, I think it's a lost cause. Let me just get us back a little bit here to, to Miami and to Palm Beach, actually. So you mentioned that you have, a lot of, you have property in Palm Beach, and you also have commercial property here in Palm Beach. Can you tell us a little bit more about your plans for that? I'll keep that short and simple. We have commercial property on Worth Avenue and we will be redeveloping it to have a fantastic storefront experience, restaurant experience, and office space on the, on the second and third floors. Mm -hmm. Do you already have the tenants or no? Do That's I have tenants? We, it's the the, the challenge is it's not that we, do we have tenants, it's picking who we want as a tenant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you cannot believe the number of incoming phone calls of people looking for space here in Palm Beach. In a building that's not that well known that we own publicly. Mm -hmm. It seems that people that are in retail or in restaurants are able, like, they want space here. How long that redevelopment is going to take? I'll be updating that actually in the next two or three weeks. So that's, that's on our list of development okay. projects right now. And that one's important to me. It's right here in Palm Beach. Yeah. 
Well, it's important to all of these people, actually. <laughs> yes, the Neiman Marcus store needs to be returned back to its, its place of grandeur yeah. here. And since we're talking about real estate, you actually have plans to build what's going to be a standout, a standout tower in Miami. You have plans to build a standout tower in New York. How is life of Ken Griffin real estate mo mogul now? How is being a real estate tycoon? Well, I'm not. <laughs> I, have, I have land. Between land and buildings, a lot of work. But let me tell you why we're going to build these buildings. We have been committed to return to the office from, from literally the early days of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we spent an in, 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 incomprehensible amount of money to bring our people back to our offices right out of the gate at the start of the pandemic for whether it was COVID testing or robots with UV lights to clean the bathrooms, uh, social distancing requirements. You could just imagine, I, I felt like I was running a, a healthcare institution for a period <laughs> of time. But why would we do that? I think there's just, just incredible value in people collaborating together, working together, innovating together. And come summer of 2021, we brought everybody back to work five days a week. I ask a lot of my team in doing so. You know, we're in a world where that's not common yet. What we have found is, is our team has embraced this, but we want to make sure that we have facilities in our, in our two primary cities that represent the commitment that we want to make to our team members in terms of, of their sense of, of health safety, quality of life, working environment, that parallels the incredible commitment that they make to each other and to the firm. And therefore, we're going to be building a, a new skyscraper in Miami and a new skyscraper in New York, which will, which will fulfill that, that goal of ours. How easy it is to get people in Miami who actually like live by the beach back to the office five days a week? Well, since they all came from Chicago, they didn't know that life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I, there's no signs of a different work ethic in Miami than there was in Chicago. I mean, my colleagues love what they do. They enjoy working with each other. You know, people, people talk about, well, if you go to Florida, will people be as committed to their work? Look, if you go home and it's blue skies and it's sunny and your kids come home from school and, and you know what? They're happy. And it's amazing how a school devoid of woke ideology leads itself to happy children. I, th I think people are much, much happier in their lives and in their careers when their personal life is in a good place. So here, the audience, I'm sure, has one big question that they want me to ask. A lot of people here have their own charities, and I know that you've been ramping up your charity givings here in Florida. What are your, what, what are your priorities here? Education then education, and a bit more education. So that's, that hands down is the biggest priority, both supporting the schools in Miami that support the community. That's really important to us. You know, we can see the impact of so many people having moved to Miami on the, on the educational infrastructure. And then how do we support the institutions of higher education? Because for us, that's such an important source of talent. You know, in Chicago or in New York, your Columbia's, your NYU's, your University of Chicago's, these are really important, important feeder schools of talent. How do we make sure that, that Miami has strong, strong programs in areas in STEM that feed us our talent base? So that's, that's really number one, is education. And that, that's not just at the upper echelons. You know, one of the things that we supported during the pandemic here in Miami was was broadband access for children of lower income households. Mm -hmm. How do we help to cross the digital divide such that every student in Miami has a chance to, to realize their full potential? So education, hands down, number one. Number two is public safety. And you know, this is why Miami is so great. In Chicago, we had, we had real success with creating facilities that integrated predictive analytics so that the police force could better deploy their resources to improve public safety. Mm -hmm. And when we did this in Chicago under Mayor Emanuel, who I, I think the world of, 
It brought crime down, murders down, by remarkable double-digit percentages in many of the communities that this was deployed. Now, all that value was lost in the J.B. Pritzker, Kim Fox, Lori Lightfoot days, but Miami embraced that. And we're going to support that build out across metropolitan Miami as Miami continues just to bring its crime rate down. Like, I, I love the commitment that they have to the streets being safe, where you can walk outdoors between a restaurant and your house and just not worry. It's, it's hard to imagine in Chicago, you know, I have friends that would take Ubers to go four blocks. You just didn't want to be on the streets. And if it sounds melodramatic, like, I had four colleagues robbed at gunpoint at Citadel. I had a colleague stabbed a few hundred yards from the office. I had two colleagues with bullets flying through their car. I had roughly 25 bullet holes in the front, or the, the first story of the building where I live. The store across the street from me, they drove a van through the window to help facilitate stealing all the goods from the store. And my favorite is they tried to carjack my security driver from the front door of my house. So if it, if it sounds like a third world country, I actually think it's unfair to most third world countries where the respect that people have for their neighborhoods and one another seems to transcend what is now tolerated in Chicago. Then what would you say is the, you really mentioned kind of like what you see the benefits of being Florida. What you see, what would you say are the downsides? So the city is going to have, well, Miami in particular has to deal with, with affordable housing. Now, because they have good zoning laws here that will facilitate builders building, the housing issue will address itself in due course, but due course can be years, and there's people struggling with the increase in price in housing. You know, again, you've got, you've got all these people moving here that puts a demand in place for real estate, and the locals just, they're, like, they're now competing with people that have moved from New York, they've moved from San Francisco, they've moved from across the country. That's, that has really led to a dramatic level of housing inflation. And the faster that we can build housing in Miami, the better. So that's, that's a challenge. And, and frankly, credit to the government for being very on top of this and for working with the development community to help address that problem. That shovels in the ground, that's getting buildings built, that's really important. Uh, you know, we talked about education already, the sort of surge of, of students coming to Miami. That's, that, again, that's a big lift. And, and if you talk to the private schools, they're building new buildings. They're going to build new campuses. They're going to open new, new facilities. So we're seeing the supply side respond to this. And of course, the public school system will have to build new schools, will have to augment their current facilities. So we're seeing that be addressed. Congestion's a problem. There's a lot of cars on the road. When it's all said and done, though, you'd much take this set of problems as a city than the inverse. <laughs> and I've lived through the inverse. You know, the, we talked about people moving to Miami. Illinois had a massive exodus of people over the last decade. Something like, I think it's 200,000 people left in the two years of the pandemic. All of a sudden, your schools are 60% full. Your streets in the city are empty. Your restaurants are closing. You'd much rather take the challenges of growth than the challenges of a declining state. So you've already brought up politics in this conversation, so I have to ask you about that as well. I mean, we were talking a little bit about, about your philanthropic giving, but you're also one of the biggest political, donation, political donors in the country right now. And we interviewed J.P. Pritzker at Bloomberg recently. And he said, and I'm quoting here, he was willing to spend whatever it takes to keep Republicans, namely Ron DeSantis, out of the White House. Are you willing to spend whatever it takes to get him elected? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would spend whatever it takes to make sure that J.B. Pritzker's never in the White House. <laughs> I mean, you know, what's funny is, is in Illinois, you know, the, the JB was in a race for the governor against a to-be-determined Republican primary candidate. And I, I supported a, a man, Richard Irvin from Aurora, who was a fantastic mayor, really, really solid person. And, uh, and I knew early on in the primary that, that we were actually moving to Florida. I, my kids had applied to go to school down here. We bought a $300 million parcel of land in Miami to build a new office building. And I found myself writing checks for about $50 million to support Richard Irvin, 
knowing I was going to leave. Now, JB, to his credit, won the primary on the Republican side by supporting the um, mega Trump candidate, who he constantly would deplore in the actual runoff, but he spent $35 million meddling in the Republican primary to try to position himself against the weaker of two candidates. Why would I spend $50 million in the Republican primary in a state that I had no intention to live in? I thought the best gift I could leave Illinois was good leadership. And it breaks my heart that he was reelected because the state of Illinois deserves good leadership. My family traces its history back there for 100 plus years. Illinois will always have a special place in my heart, but I watch, I watch the policies of J.B. Pritzker destroy one of the great states in this nation. It breaks my heart. So I will, I will absolutely spend whatever it takes to make sure he's never president. Now, on the Republican side, you know, we're going to have a really interesting primary ahead of us. Mm -hmm. I, I'm actually, I'm not going to talk about Ron DeSantis because the state of Florida speaks for itself. Really? People here are going to be very sad. <laughs> no, actually, they, they won't be because he won the state in a re-election for governor by yeah. an absolute landslide. And I think that speaks to what people want in their leadership. They want a government that works for them. They want a government that is thoughtful about minding their checkbook as taxpayers. They want their children educated. They want their streets to be safe. And they want, they want their communities to prosper. I think that's a simple message. And I don't think I need to talk about Ron DeSantis. I just need to look across the state and realize that message is being delivered here in Florida. Now, I'd like to see that message across America again. It, it, is, it is absolutely heartbreaking to see where the progressive liberal agenda is being unleashed and the damage it's doing to our cities and more fundamentally to our children. What we do to ourselves as adults, that's up to us. But in Illinois, there are 53 schools without a single child at grade level. That's where J.B. Pritzker's policies lead you to. And when we take away a future from a child, it's, it's almost like the most hideous form of silent homicide ever. We are destroying their dreams before they have a chance to even exist. That's J.B. Pritzker's world. So the American voters, I think, will see what opportunity looks like when they look at the state of Florida in two years. They'll make a decision, and I think that the results in the state speak for themselves. Do you think Ron should run? I'd, I would love to see him run. And then I know you said you wouldn't talk about DeSantis, but let me ask you one question about him then, and we'll move on to another topic. What policies that he has that you actually disagree with? Because you said that you listed all of his successes, education, crime-fighting policies. Which ones you are not 100% in line with? Well, I mean, here's the big picture. There's no politician where any of us are going to be in line with all their policies. Like, that doesn't exist. All right? Like, every politician strengths what you like, mm -hmm. weaknesses what you don't like, all right? This is just, this is ubiquitous. I mean, the, the New York Times wrote this really nasty article about Rahm Emanuel, because I was one of Rahm's big supporters. I'm like, why don't you applaud the fact that the two of us who are on two sides of the aisle can find common ground on 90% of the issues that matter to our city? Mm -hmm. Why don't you applaud that? Why don't you think about how good it is that we're aligned against education, we're aligned against having safe streets, we're aligned against having a prosperous business community? Why do we need to find fault when we find the ability to find common ground? But now let's talk about Ron for a second as governor of the state of Florida. I've said before, I don't agree with how we handle the Disney situation in the end. It's my personal opinion. I think it's intimidating when the government takes steps that may look or feel like retribution. The CEO of Disney picked a fight with, with Governor DeSantis. Governor DeSantis is allowed to pick a fight back. But that should be a choice of words. And I think that removing this, this special uh, governance status of Disney in their, in their home county, that feels like overreach. That feels like retribution. And even if it wasn't, the timing's terrible. And the reason that that's so problematic is if you're a small business owner, you say to yourself, well, wait, if the state can hurt Disney at a whim, they can wipe me out in a moment. And that discourages entrepreneurship. 
and that discourages the wheels of commerce. So that, that's one that worries me. I, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the messaging around the vaccinations that the governor's currently engaged in. It's a really tricky issue, and this one strikes close to home. Operation, Operation Warp, Warp Speed, Speed originated at Citadel. It was a conversation I had with the White House at the start of the pandemic about the value of us pre-purchasing vaccines before we knew if they worked. Time to market. If we have to wait for a vaccine to be approved, then we ramp up manufacturing, we're going to lose valuable months, and that means we're going to lose hundreds of thousands or millions of lives. Why, why do I worry about the governor's messaging here? Right now, we're very fortunate. The, the coronavirus has, has mutated from Delta to Omicron. Omicron is, I mean, thank you God, it is for most people like a very bad cold. Delta goes right for the lungs. By the time your immune system can respond, you may be dead. Omicron goes for the sinuses, the upper respiratory tract, the throat. It's, it's, it's much less deadly. But if we create a mindset that vaccines are just intrinsically dangerous, and he has some, there are nuanced points where he's right. For teenage boys, it's not clear to me you'd want to vaccinate them. It's a really interesting debate. But if you make people fearful of vaccines and we see a turn to a more dangerous strain again, and there's no assurance that it's a one-way street that you know, we go Delta to Omicron and the next one's even less problematic, it could be more problematic, but if we made people worried about taking vaccines, there could be an enormous loss of life. So that, for example, is one where I, I don't agree with the governor's I don't agree with his choice of words or how he's positioning the issue. And again, he has a lot of good points behind the dialogue, but when you're in public office, you have a very loud voice like he does, and I love much of what he has to say, those nuances can get lost. So I'm conscious of the time here, and I have to open the floor up for questions, but I do have one, other, one question before I do that. So I've actually brought someone here to ask you a question, and that someone is ChatGPT. And by the looks of it, ChatGPT is asking you for a job. Because I asked him, what should I ask Ken Griffin? And he said, well, you should ask Ken Griffin about the role artificial intelligence is playing in finance in coming years. So Ken, have you ever actually used ChatGPT? And how do you use that on Citadel? Are you offering him a job? Or it, right? Well, so it's a great question. Raise your hand if you use ChatGPT. Oh, that few. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to say this. You've got to go home and try it. <laughs> All right? Because you can literally pose it a question and mm -hmm. it will answer your question. You can say something like, write a story about a murder mystery at the Four Arts Society in Palm Beach. And it'll write a story. With Ken Griffin as the lead character? <laughs> I don't want to be the protagonist in that story necessarily. <laughs> but you can, you, can, you can generate, it'll generate that story on the fly. Okay. You can also give it computer programming code in one language and say, please convert this to a different programming language. And it will do that. You could say on the next generation of it, draft me a lease contract to lease my house. Mm -hmm. It'll write the lease. This branch of AI will be game changing for the economy because it will take a, a, an enormous amount of work that's done today by people and do it in a distinctly different, mm -hmm. highly automated, highly efficient way. And that will have real bearing on our economy. That's, that's gonna be a game changer for the economy. And, and like most changes in technology with clear winners and losers, but this is, this is going to be the future, and it's worth going home, op signing into ChatGPT, open an account, and experiment for, for 20, 30, 40 minutes, and impress your grandchildren. Like, they'll think you're so cool for doing this. It is the fastest growing consumer application in the history of the internet. Have you started using it as Citadel? We are right now, trying to negotiate an enterprise-wide license. Really? Yes. For what, specifically? Everything, what are the ideas you're throwing around? So everything from helping our developers write better code 
to translating software between languages, uh, to analyze various types of information that we analyze in the ordinary course of our business, this branch of technology has real impact on our business. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually really excited to see how this changes the world.